I must confess, I've only been to university for about five weeks, so this is, if I stay any longer, I'll probably be beating that. Um, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about um, design today, and I think uh, I've got about half an hour or so to, to talk about some of the ways we've used design to our advantage and, and tried to make GoSquared a, a nicely designed service and how it's helped us grow to where we are today. Um, and Basically, I was just going to talk a bit about Go Squared, just a few minutes, about how we've built the company, and then uh, go into a bit more depth about um, some of the ways I think uh, great design can help companies uh, be successful today. Um, so yeah, uh, without further ado, um, this is me and my co-founders, um, Jeff and JT, uh, and me. And uh, we currently... Uh, well, we build GoSquared, and GoSquared is essentially a real-time web analytics service. And uh, that basically means we provide a nice dashboard like this, uh, and it shows you all the insights about what's happening on your site right now. So we show you how many people are on the website, um, what content is popular, what's driving people to the website. And we're going into more useful information, like uh, are people actually converting on the website? Are people purchasing the items you're selling, things like that. But basically, it's kind of a much easier, much better way of understanding and improving your website. And on top of that, everything shows in the dashboard as it happens. And so that's a really big engineering task. But also, it enables us to do some really nice and beautiful visualizations, <laughs> which is why I'm quite passionate about design. And uh, the, a lot of that, I think, or hopefully, is reflected in our, in our product. We now have quite a few customers and sites using us, which we're very proud of. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to move on to uh, how, how I think design is, is, can be used to, to, great, to build success as a company. And I wanted to talk about um, a, a take a leaf out of a, a, a popular designer's book and talk about 10 principles of good design. Now, these were actually outlined by Dieter Rams, who uh, was the, I think, the, yeah, the chief design officer of Braun. And uh, he's a, a very famous designer in the industry and basically is like a god to me. <laughs> and uh, he's influenced a lot of what we call product design today. So a lot of Apple's products, Jonathan Ive was uh, very inspired by him. And he laid out these essentially like 10 commandments of, of good design. So, I'll go through them one by one and talk about how I can see them being used in uh, the web industry and the startup industry of today to, to great effect. So um, yeah, uh, principle one that he laid out was good design should be innovative. And, and so um, essentially, uh, he was saying that technology is always innovating and design <coughs> innovates alongside that in tandem. And, uh, and, and essentially, um, one of the ways that uh, like a, a lot of companies are really pushing forward on their technology, but um, sometimes the design lags behind. And I think some of the best companies today are actually innovating with design at, at the same rate. And so a great example of that is um, there was a guy who made the first app, uh, one of the best apps for Twitter back in the day. And it was called Tweety. And he introduced this feature called pull to refresh, which really changed the way we kind of refresh fast changing content on our devices. Everyone used to hit a refresh button and it refreshed the whole screen and it'd be a really rubbish experience for users. And he introduced this feature in, into his Tweety app. It was just him on his own as a developer. And, uh, and it was a, a huge success. And one of, the reason, one of the things that caused Tweety to be bought by Twitter and now the app that he built is now the, the default app for Twitter. And that interaction is now rolled out into a lot of the apps we see on the App Store today. And it was just an example of how little innovations within the interface have caused the, the success and of, of one guy and his business. Um, so that was, a, yeah, that was just one little example of, of innovation. Uh, just a small one, but had a big impact. Um, Principle two, good design makes a product useful. That, that's obvious, right? But um, a lot of people seem to think that kind of design is maybe like this veneer that you put on top, that you, 
kind of make something look pretty. And, and actually, you know, design isn't about making something look nicer. It, it's, it's often more about how do you get rid of the distracting features, get rid of the dis distracting stuff, and help the user focus on what's important. And um, I think a good example of that is Google's applications, so like Google Docs and Google Presently and, and things like that, um, which help people collaborate much better and, and help people actually get their jobs done a lot better. And um, you compare it to tools like uh, you know, Microsoft Word and, and PowerPoint and things like that, which are very bulky, very cumbersome, and are, are now ultimately getting shifted out in the way of it to make way for, for Google's apps. And you look at the design philosophies that Google's adopted, and a lot of them are about just making the apps work fast. And also, by being based online, they, they enable people to collaborate much better. And uh, I think that's just a really good example of how um, Google's decided very clearly on what the use case for these apps is and, and designed to make, make, build them around that and take advantage of the scenario they're in. Um, Good design is aesthetic. So uh, I think what Dieter Rams meant by this is that you know, good design, ideally, products should be beautiful. If products are beautiful, then they make us feel good. And we want to feel good every day, right? <laughs> and so um, I was thinking about the huge number of services out there that seem to look amazing. There's, there's tons of things out there. Most of the services we use on a daily basis are getting much better looking in the web world anyway. Uh, but when you look back five, 10 years at how the, the web used to look, we use these products that it kind of really didn't look great. You know, the, the web was still in its infancy, and the, the, the ability to make services look great was, was really difficult. Um, so uh, you know, there's things like Google, which have always kind of had this utilitarian approach of design. They didn't try and make things look beautiful. But there's also a bunch of services out there that are kind of focusing on just making a beautiful experience. And, and one of those is, is an app called Path, which in the days of Facebook seems ridiculous that someone should be trying to build a social network uh, when Facebook is clearly dominating with their billion plus users. Um, but Path is a, a really interesting app that um, it, it's simply like Facebook, but much more beautiful. It's a pleasure to use. It shows off what your friends are doing. It, it focuses on the content really nicely. And um, to date, they've raised about 40 million in funding. I can't really comment on how successful they are as a business, but um, they they seem to be doing a great job of, of gaining attention and creating an app that people love to use. And I think if um, if Facebook took even more of a a similar approach to Path on their design, who knows where they could be. Um, uh, principle four, good design makes a product understandable. Um, ideally, products should be self-explanatory. Like Services should be self-explanatory. I still find that the majority of services you use out there, even by the big guys, are, are so difficult to, to comprehend. You know, How many times do you have to go to a support doc to work out what you need to do, or ask a friend how you do x, y, and z in, in, uh, in a certain application or an app. Um, and ideally, it should all be, be self-explanatory. It should be so simple. Coming back to the example of Google, for instance, everyone knows when they see that search box that, that that's where you search for a, a web page. Um, but I, I found out quite an interesting thing the other day, which I hadn't really noticed. On the iPhone, um, the home button, everyone knows that goes back to your home screen, I think. But there's a very subtle little detail in that the, the, the little square that just seems like a, a decoration is actually exactly the same dimensions and proportions to the, the icons on the home screen. And it really underlines how, how Apple's kind of thought about this whole process much deeper than a lot of people at first think. So for instance, like a lot of people suggest they put widgets and different visualizations on the home screen or change it or make it more interesting. But actually, th this absolute simplicity and uh, ease of use really just helps to make the product self-explanatory and, and use it without having to read a single line of, of documentation. Um, at principle five, good design should be unobtrusive. So, 
um, a, a kind of along the lines of just making things more, more useful, but more that the design you do shouldn't get in the way of what the user is trying to actually do. Um, so, you know, okay, good design, often people say good design is something that looks good, but actually good design should really be about things that get the job done and don't try and compete with me to get my task done. Again, Google is a great example of that, but there's, there's tons of other things. There's, there's, for instance, the iPod and just playing a song. You can, I think one of their guiding principles when they were designing the interface of the iPod was uh, along the lines of uh, you, you should be able to play a song in, in under five taps or under five button presses. And, um, and I think they've moved further and further towards that with things like Shuffle, where you can just get to playing music in one button, in one button press. And you compare that to so many of the other MP3 players and things that are out at the time, especially, especially when, for instance, Sony were trying to move into the space. There'd be tens of buttons and different navigation hierarchies, and you'd almost have to go through like an Excel spreadsheet to get to the songs you wanted to play. Um, but a, a really interesting app that's, that's not by one of the big guys that, that came out, I think, later, uh, fairly late last year is an app called Clear, which is basically a, a to-do list app. Um, but the interesting thing is it doesn't actually have any interface component. Like, there, there is no buttons in the interface. Essentially, the whole app is your content, is your to-do list. And to add an item, you pull down from the, from the top, and you get a new thing saying add an item. To say you've done an item, you just swipe across, and it's done. And it's an incredibly beautifully designed app that is so simple. And everyone kind of thinks, oh, to-do lists were done ages ago. But these guys came along, brought this out, and I think in, in about the first week of, of being on sale in the App Store, they sold 350,000 copies. And that was a, a, just under a dollar each. So um, you know, there's a lot to be said for great looking design that really gets the job done, even if it's supposedly a task or a product that's supposedly already been done. Um, principle six, good design is honest. Um, I think Dieter Rams, when he was talking about this, was very much coming at it from a product design perspective of, you know, you shouldn't kind of paint wood to look like metal and things like that. But, but in, in the modern day of, of the web and of online interfaces, on on-screen interfaces, I, I think it also applies. Um, and I think Apple are actually kind of uh, can be criticized here for their, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the term skeuomorphic design. But if you look at the, say, the calendar app on the iPad or uh, the notes app, you'll see these ridiculous interfaces which kind of mimic real life items. So the notes app on the iPad has this um, yellow paper, which is OK, but um, there's sort of a leather bound border around it. And even a, a kind of pocket on the side, which actually covers up some of your list so you can't use it. And, um, I don't know, someone at Apple thought it was a good idea, but um, in reality, it's a pretty stupid idea when we have this screen that can show so much information that we would try and mimic an older object just to perhaps look pretty. Um, and that's why I think uh, Microsoft have actually done a really good job with Windows 8. They've kind of gone back to basics and tried to make a really clear interface that, that doesn't try and mimic or, or replicate real-world objects. They're just trying to make a clean, simple interface with nice icons. And it's flat, and it's simple, and it's very much more like the days of print and graphic design um, in the offline world. Uh, and I think um, so far, you know, Windows, the new version of Windows seems to be getting a lot more popul popular. And it's great to see that they haven't just copied Apple down this skeuomorphic design route. And they're actually bringing some really interesting ideas to the table. And, I think actually going forward, we'll see Apple returning to more of this style. And everyone in the industry seems to be going to much more of a clear, concise style that is cleaner and also doesn't require so much graphics processing and intense processing on the part of the computer or the device to generate these fancy, pointless, needless images. Um, so yeah, nice one, Microsoft. Uh, good design is long lasting. Again, I, I think this does obviously stem from uh, the product design world where um, 
you know, building a product that can withstand the test of time and doesn't mind getting battered around the edges and, and things like that is very sensible. But I, I think it also kind of comes into the, the realm of not designing to be meeting the fashions of the time and not jumping on trends like Web 2.0 glossy styles and things like that. And um, I think right now there's tons of different styles and variations going on. And we're not really in the era of a, a fad necessarily in web interface design so much as there are just so many different things going on that everyone can uh, you know, do what they think is best for their, their, their sector. But um, one of the interesting examples of, of uh, designing for the long term is a payments company called Square. I would, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of them. Essentially, they do real world payments via your mobile device. So um, I say I run a cafe and you uh, want to accept payments and you don't want to have to buy a big complex till system and pay tons of money to Visa to accept cards at your, at your cafe, you can um, get a free square card reader device which plugs into your iPhone and it will allow you to accept payments right there with a square, um, the square app from the App Store. But the important thing is that that square card reader device plugs into your, your iPhone's headphone jack. Um, in comparing that to a couple, a couple of other companies that are in the industry, they actually design their card readers to sort of work with the dot connector on, on the iPhone. And they really limited their growth potential through that because um, you know, since Square first came out, the iPhone's dot connector has changed. But they've also rolled it out onto other platforms like Android and BlackBerry and things like that. And, um, it was just a, a kind of example of, of Square thinking about the long term for their platform rather than just um, what, what, what can we do today, what, what's out there today, and let's try and meet those requirements. And um, I think Square are doing pretty well now. They're processing a heck of a load of transactions in the US, and they have companies like Starbucks using them to, to accept payments in a lot of their stores in the US. So um, Square are a very inspiring company, and I, I really admire them for a lot of their design work, especially. Um, we're almost there. Step eight. Uh, good design is thorough down to the last detail. And um, I, I think uh, when Dieter Rams put this in his list of 10 principles, he was talking about how much care to put into product design. Um, I think. Uh, a care for the design of the product, a deep care, not just for how it looks, but for how it works and for the materials or the choices of things you use to build the product, shows ultimately a care for the user or the customer. And um, a great example of this is uh, another payments company, actually. But these guys are called Stripe. And they're, also, they're based in San Francisco. And they're trying to take on PayPal. Uh, PayPal, I think most people would agree, is a fairly frustrating and, and annoying service. Um, and Stripe is trying to change that and, and offer a, a beautiful alternative that is easy to use, not just for you as a company trying to sell things, but also for the, the end user as well, who will be purchasing <laughs> things through you. And, and Stripe have built this product that is incredibly beautiful. They give you a, a lovely dashboard which shows you how much money you're making and the products you're selling most of. Uh, but they also give you these lovely payment forms that you can embed on your site that allow your customers to pay you with just one credit card number and, and your CVV code. Um, whereas comparing that to the majority of other online payment forms uh, on the internet, you have to give like a credit card number, full billing address, expiry date, start date, all this, your mother's maiden name, all of that fun, fun stuff. And Stripe have cut through all of that to just ask you for these two fields. And on the surface, it looks like, oh, OK, it's just a simpler form. But in actual fact, to do that, they've had to speak to merchant banks and industry insiders and even governments throughout the US and now the EU as they're rolling out into the EU. And it actually involves speaking to hundreds of different organizations and trying to change the fundamentals of how the industry works just to provide this better experience for their, their customers and their users. And um, I just think that's incredibly inspiring. And the, the fact that they're going to that extra level 
um, not only that share, shows that they care for their, their customers, but it shows that they care for their customers' customers. And, uh, and I, I think they're going to be doing extremely well as they continue to roll out around the world, because PayPal needs some competition. Um, good design is environmentally friendly. Um, obviously, this talks a lot about building products so that they can be dismantled at the end of their lifetime and so that they will last last longer and so that you use the right, the right materials to make a, a product that won't be harmful to the environment. But one of the most interesting companies that I'd like to talk about on this subject is a company building a, a thing called Nest. And I, I don't know how many of you have heard of Nest, but it's a really inspiring idea that um, essentially takes the boring thermostat in most people's houses. Um, you know, usually a horrible plasticky box that no one really cares about. And these guys, I think ex-product designers and engineers from Apple, uh, thought set out to transform the thermostat and what it can be. And instead of just being this stupid box that sits on the wall and gets turned when you feel it's too hot or too cold, it's connected to the internet via Wi-Fi and learns your patterns throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the year so that it's constantly adjusting to the environment around it. And it's this device that not only has amazing functionality, but also looks beautiful so that you treasure it. And uh, their ultimate goal as a, as a company is to save, um, save energy usage around the world. So one person in one house may not have the biggest impact, but when millions of people are using this device to control their, their house's heating, then the net effect is just is, is huge. And the, there's some great little interface um, enhancements and ideas they've come up with to almost gamify the idea of saving energy. Um, you know, there's no monetary reward directly from Nest. Nest aren't paying you to, to save energy. But the simple idea that when you're running a few degrees lower than you would normally, you get a little green leaf, which shows you're being good to the environment. And um, and it's just an incredibly inspiring idea that I think is going to change the way people think about saving energy in their, in their homes. And I hope it comes to the UK soon. Um, 10 of 10. We're almost there. Um, good design is as little design as possible. Um, I think this often gets confused with less is better, but I think Dieter Rahm's exact quote is, less but better. Um, and essentially, it's all about concentrating on the essentials of the product or the service. So focusing on what really, really matters to the user. What is the, the one goal of that device or that product or that service? And what is all the stuff that isn't relevant that we can just cut out? And I think um, the iPod goes a long way in showing that. The device on the left is something that Braun made. I don't actually know what it is, but uh, the one on the right is obviously the iPod. And there's that clear inspiration from, from Braun's uh, design style. But again, um, you know, the iPod came out in 2001, I think. And its sole purpose was to help you listen to music on the go. And by focusing on those, the key task of playing music and finding the right songs to play and to get you listening to music as quickly as possible was what they set out as the, the core idea of the device. And everything else was extra. And so everything else didn't really exist. And so there's no, nothing else. There's no like, calendar or um, you know, games on there or internet or browsers or email or anything. It's just, how do I listen to music quickly? And I think a lot of that, the simplicity, is what led to the iPod being so damn successful. Um, so yeah, that is my talk. And I hope it's been useful. And I'd love to talk with you some more and answer some questions if you have any. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Cool. Cheers. Hi. Um, how do you compare doing doing less, but? Yeah, I think it's a lot around just sort of 
um, focusing on the, the features that really matter and just focusing all of your time and effort into those one or two things rather than spreading yourself too thin and um, investing in all these different aspects of the, the product and then uh, and, and watering down the vision, I think. Because, I mean, we've had that kind of challenge at, at Go Squared, um, building an analytics service. You know, there's, there's things out there that do every feature under the sun. And all the time you get customers telling you to build this and to build that. And um, if you go ahead and build all those things, you end up with this incredibly watered down product that in the end is just like what the competitor has. Um, but instead, by just saying no to almost everyone and by focusing on the key things that really seem important and by refining them and making them the best they can be, I think that's a great way to, to exceed and, and win against other competitors, yeah. Cool, yeah, hi. Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, I'm trying to remind myself of all the principles now. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I do think the, the less but better uh, one is, is definitely important. Um, I also think the designing unobtrusively is, is a really good one because I think so many people make, uh, yeah, so many people think of design as, as a sort of, thing that you put on at the end that you like, OK, we bought the product now. Let's get a designer in and make it look pretty. Let's put the colors in, the logo, and get it all looking great. You have designed a web application, so you could do the back end separately. Exactly, exactly. I think that's like also at Go Squared, for instance, um, I'm the only kind of non-engineer on the team. So in many ways, I'm often viewed as the idiot on the team. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I'm also the designer. And um, I, I think what we try and do is lead by design first. Because if you can work out not just how it's going to look, but what the user is going to do and the journey the user goes through from you know, just coming to the site and checking it out through to actually taking an action, say, learning about who's on their website and, and doing things like that, thinking about things as a flow um, definitely is a great way to build the product underneath it to build all of the infrastructure and the, the, the write the code underneath what, so what, what you design. Do you um, I use a pen and a paper quite a lot. Um, so everything I design always starts with just sketching it out, really. Um, but from there, I usually I used to use Adobe Illustrator for designing things, but I recently just outright refused to keep paying Adobe money. So. Um, I found this really nice app called Sketch, which is built by some guys in, I think, in London, or at least they're in the UK. And they've built a really nice app that kind of is a crossover between Photoshop and Illustrator. And it's purely designed for designing things for the web. And it uses uh, the same rendering engine behind Safari um, WebKit uh, to render everything. So you can do great designs. It's really natural to use and export it in a format that's really just ready to be used in, in web development. And, and that's really nice. Um, in terms of the code and development side, there's a lot that goes on, but most of the services are built in, in JavaScript. So we use Node.js, um, and we're built on top of Amazon Web Services as a hosting platform. Yeah. Uh, go, go for it, man. <laughs> and apart from the pizza runs, but, uh, what mm. That's a good, good question. Um, uh, I mean, I've been quite obsessed with Dieter Rams for a while because I got bought a book which is called Less Is More, which is all about his design. Um, I've also followed <laughs> Apple for ages, and I've watched a lot of the keynotes where they've announced products, and I found th those to be amazing in the way that, you know, I, I don't like to my think of myself as an Apple fanboy, but I'm just amazed at the way they announce products and the way that their design isn't just added at the end, that they think about the design in, com in conjunction with the engineering, con in conjunction with the marketing as well. Um, in terms of resources, uh, I definitely get a lot of inspiration from <coughs> Dribbble, uh, the design community. I, I don't know if you guys have seen Dribbble, but it's like Dribbble but with three Bs. And it's where a lot of web designers and graphic designers show off their 
their work. And it's similar in some ways to Twitter in that there's a, a limitation in what you can post. But with Twitter, it's 140 characters. With Dribbble, it's 400 by 300 pixels. So you get this quite small space to show off your work. Um, and some of the best designers in the world, web designers in the world, are, are on Dribbble. Um, so definitely, yeah, I like that. And there's also a few, a few great blogs as well. Um, Smashing Magazine is a great blog. They do some really nice content. Um, and I don't know, I think there's a, there's a ton of other stuff um, out there. Another thing that's really cool in London, that they're actually based in the same building as us, but they're on the floor above, is uh, a company called General Assembly, who are um, teaching classes for design, coding, and entrepreneurship. And they get practitioners from the, like, t who are currently in real, uh, real companies who um, are currently graphic designers or web designers or whatever. Um, and they teach classes on user experience, user interface design, and things like that. So I've been going to a lot more things just in the real world, actually, uh, around London. Um, so there's lots of things like that which I'd check out. But in terms of uh, blogs and sites, I think those are the, the, main, the main ones. But I'll, if you, uh, yeah, if you give me your email, I'll try and list a few more out when I can think a bit straighter. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, um, how do you feel about sort of A-B testing on Twitter? Mm. Testing the site, and that's something you do? Yeah, um, A-B testing is actually, we've done quite a bit of it. Um, and often it can, I, I, I found often it's led us down the wrong path. Um, because you sort of, you look at this test and you think, oh, God, this one's winning by 1%, and let's go for that. But often there's things that matter a just as much, if not more than, like a tiny conversion increase. Things like your brand and how you come across as a company. And you know, if, if painting your website pink and using Comic Sans as the font increases conversion, do you really want to do that? Um, not that it does. I don't think it does. Um, but yeah, A-B a testing is all, it ha has been quite useful. We've done some things like uh, on our plans and pricing page, we've AB tested that a heck of a lot. So we've done things like just change the title to say 14 day free trial or um, money back guarantee, things like that. And, and also just changing the way we display the plans. Like for instance, which order we show them in, like uh, from lowest to highest price or from highest to lowest. And do we show that there's a free plan? Do we make a big deal of that? Do we try and hide it? and all sorts of things. And um, I, I just think the most important thing with like, data-driven decisions like that is, is just understanding kind of what the actual deciders of success are. Because um, you know, when you run an A-B test, you could say that a click-through onto that link, uh, more click-throughs to that link is a success. But actually, you probably want to go a bit further and say, click-throughs to becoming a user signed up with the service is a success. But then you might want to go even further and say a user signing up that then upgrades down the line is a success. But to go that far is actually really, really difficult. And um, I, I think often A-B testing can lead people to make decisions that actually may not necessarily have the best outcomes. Um, but yeah, I know uh, there's a company called 37 Signals that uh, do some really interesting stuff around there, and they blog about it all the time. And, Love that. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, cool. Anyone else? Yeah, go for it. Where can a startup get a good designer? Where can a startup get a good designer? Oh, if I knew that. Um, I think, uh, well, I think Dribbble actually is a really good place to start. Um, Dribbble has, like, obviously, you can just check out what people are working on, but they also have a job board on there now, so you can find people that are looking to work. Um, I think it is really hard to find people that want to work full time, um, especially when you're starting off at a lower salary. But often people are willing to give advice and at least do some freelance work. And, um, and yeah, I think the great thing about Dribbble is it really has given designers this hub online. And I would say that's probably the best pl place to, to start. Yeah. Um, we've always, well, because I'm a designer, we've always had one in the team. Hopefully, I'll be in the team for a bit longer. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think personally, I, I mean, I'm quite biased, but I, I do think that having design as a full time position in the company, once you're at like 
four or five people is, is kind of essential to building a service that looks amazing. I mean, it doesn't apply for all businesses, but I think when, when you're a company that builds a service and provides it to your customers, to have the design as being an outsourced thing is, is a dangerous position to be, especially when you're, you're growing your engineering team and you have engineers building stuff without working to a prototype or to a, a design that a user is going to see. I, I think that's it's really difficult to do that without having someone on the team full time. Um, but you know there are companies that do it and seem to do it okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone has slightly different tastes. I, I think one of the things we try to do with Go Squared is um, build, design, have a design style that doesn't really offend anyone. Um, and I, I think that like, by keeping the color scheme quite um, subtle and uh, to try and just make things that look, that look good in our eyes, um, and I think we kind of understand our customer base quite well. Most of them are very technically able and want to understand their website, so they're website owners. We can kind of make good assumptions about the kind of uh, taste they're going to have, I think. But there's, there's always people that don't like what we do or people that love what we do. Um, and I think just in, in general, we've been treading a, a, a good line there. Um, I think it, it definitely does depend on the service you're building, really. Most services have a fairly, like, ideally a fairly defined demographic of people that are going to be using it. And, and hopefully that will give some inclination to, to the kind of styles you can use. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think the interesting thing with the web is that you can always change things. So even if you roll with something this week, you can you can change things down the line if you start getting feedback that people hate it. <laughs> yeah, I hope that answers the question a bit. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm, like, I'm interested in sort of how you got started. What are the basic lessons you learned? But also, obviously, you know, design right at the start. Mm. Was that crucial? And did it mean you got really heavy users? Did it attract really heavy users? Yeah. Is that a good thing, bad thing? Or did it kind of change the culture? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have, but um, we, we okay. okay, cool. I'll, I'll try not to go on too much, but <laughs> um, ba basically, we we actually started Go Squared ages ago in in 2006, and that was when I was at school, at secondary school, with my two co-founders. And um, the way it actually started was we saw the Million Dollar Homepage, which was this beautiful site which sold dollar uh, pixels for a dollar each, and um, you know, a company could come along and put a nice big animated GIF uh, anywhere on this grid of pixels. But the, the guy made a million dollars out of it. So I thought, let's do that, but make it look good. And uh, that was how the name Go Squared came about. We were selling squares um, on, the, on the site, uh, squares of ad space. And uh, that, that was kind of the first way we got started. And it was all about design, really. It was about making this existing kind of business model actually and, and just executing on it on it with better design skills um, but it evolved actually quite a bit because we didn't make a million dollars out of it at all and so it, it became more of an advertising network which meant we started getting other websites on board and selling ads on behalf of them so an advertiser would come along and want to advertise on these 10 sites and we would make that happen um, and it just so happened that because we had been trying to make things look better, we had a load of designer websites that came on board. And so I think the idea of like being quite design driven was you know, right from the start. Um, eventually, we kind of just found ourselves building too much, well, building a, a lot of the stuff behind the advertising system, so the analytics around these websites. And we started getting so obsessed about how we could visualize this data, how we could provide it to people in real time, how we could just answer more questions about what was going on on the website. We eventually just rolled out this um, version of, of Go Squared called Go Squared Live Stats as a separate thing in conjunction to the advertising. And 
um, almost like an A-B test, we uh, found that people wanted the analytics stuff and didn't really care about our advertising stuff at all because that little company called Google is quite good at that. And, uh, and so we, yeah, we eventually ended up putting all of our time into the analytics side and, and morphed into this analytics company. And, and that's kind of how it, it went. Um, in terms of lessons learned, uh, <laughs> there's a heck of a lot. I don't really know where to start, but I, I think it was sensible of us at the time to just say, OK, we can't do these two different businesses at the same time and cut our losses and just said, let's not do the advertising thing and focus on, on analytics. And we were quite naive at the time, so it was lucky we, <laughs> we made that decision early enough. Um, but from then on, like, we've been able to do really exciting stuff. And we went on to raise some money from Passion Capital and Atlas Ventures um, to, to fund the business a bit more and to help grow the team. So there's, there's been a, a lot of lessons learned along the way around when to raise money and how to grow the team, how not to grow the team, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, you know, if, I, I don't want to take everyone's time too much, but I'll, I'll talk to you later if you want. Uh, and tell you a bit more, yeah. Cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, go for it. Thanks for the talk. It's brilliant. Oh, cheers. Thank you. How would you communicate to a designer who comes from the outside as a founder? How would you communicate the energy, the passion, the vision? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess to some extent that's been easier for me because I have this, this design background. Um, I, I think as a designer, like, it's just really important to understand not just what is this page going to do, but the bigger picture like vision of the company. I think designers often get a lot more excited when they know that rather than being a service that tells you how many people are on your website, that the actual ambition of the company is to you know, change the way people understand the information around their site and to help them build better websites. And I think having that bigger picture view and to try and then work back from there and break it down into the the key things that will make that happen and try and translate that into how design can help that and, and how making it easy can help that. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a kind of an important aspect of, yeah, like trying to convey it to a, to a designer. Um, and ideally, even if you're not really a designer, being able to just sketch things out and to go, rather than having lines of code on the screen, but actually be able to say that we, we need this screen and we need this screen and we need a button that does that and a form that does that, I think that goes a long way in helping convey that idea to someone who's more visually uh, minded. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hope that helps a bit. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Hi. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I can take some stabs in the dark at where I see it going. Um, I, I think that actually we're at an interesting point where until now the internet has all been like this thing you view in a browser or at the very farthest extreme it's an app that you have on your iPhone. Um, but with things like Google Glass and, and also the internet of things where these devices that like everyday objects and devices are connected to the internet i think there's a lot of like the idea of kind of just interfaces or web based interfaces might go away at some point in the next sort of 10 years and i don't know what that's going to mean for interface designers at the moment um, you know when you look at google glass there's sort of no like the main interaction method is through voice and just through looking around. There's no mouse, there's no hands even with how you in interact with that. And I think that's a really interesting kind of change on the horizon. Um, in terms of making things easier, I think like, uh, and all these slick interfaces and why they're quite popular is, you know, people seem to have less and less time. <laughs> and also with, things like an iPhone or an Android or a BlackBerry or whatever, um, you know, you have this much smaller screen space and, and much less room to do the things you need. And 
if you're trying to shove all of the features of that service into that screen space, then it's going to be impossible to use, not just, you know, not just because there'll be so many buttons on the screen because you, your fingers can't touch them, but that often on the go, also, your requirements are extremely different. You know, like, um, I'm trying to think, like, I, I, yeah, for instance, um, Domino's app, their pizza app, they, their average order value on the iPad app is something like three times what it is on the iPhone app. And they're actually two completely different apps because the, the iPad app is designed about upselling and you're like on your sofa slobbed out watching the football and you order all this different stuff. Whereas when you're on your phone, you're probably coming off the train and you just want something really quick. And it's just when, when people talk about the way to design apps and services, it, I think more and more it's just so important to think about the not the device necessarily that it's being used on, but the context in which it's being used. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question on that? Yeah, sure. I think that's, that's a really interesting point. And I wanted to ask you about being offered by yeah. um, a brand new and other designers that are Mm. Um, other that yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, it, it's often difficult to get inspired when your role is both the CEO and the designer, because I have to spend a lot of time in the office with my team. But um, personally, I find I get inspired a lot through art um, and through just being in London, uh, the architecture that's around. I, th I find, you know, I went up the Shard the other day, and there was so much like the, the, the glass and the shininess all, all, all inspired me like a little kid. Um, I also find the, the London Underground inspiring for the way their signage and branding is so consistent across the entire network. Um, I don't know of anything of that scale that is so well designed. The way they progressively disclose messages to you through the signage throughout the network and, and things like that are, and also just the color schemes and, and everything. It's, ha it's so consistently done and so impeccably well done, even when you're waiting for an hour for a train. But um, I, I think things like that. And also uh, print design as well. I think as screens are so much higher resolution now, you don't really need to think so much more about pixels. You can think about a screen just as being like a piece of paper. And so I think a lot of you know, graphic design from the print world is now going to start making its way, well, it already has started making its way back into interfaces and websites. Uh, and I, I think that's really important. But I, I think it's also just really important to be inspired by, yeah, the real world, the stuff around us, rather than, like, one of the unhealthy things about Dribble is everyone shows off their best work. And if you're getting inspired by that it's almost sort of second second hand work, second hand inspiration, and uh, it's much healthier to be inspired by the the real world. I think you come up with much more original ideas through that. Yeah, sure. I'm a headhunter. I don't start here. <laughs> cool. Trying to understand all these these young people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because I've had 25 years of doing it, and I've built big companies like Tesco, like a huge sure. company on the side. Wow. By yeah. sh getting people who are really appropriate for that business. And yeah. they stay with it. Yeah. So the chairman has just retired. 25 years he's been fantastic. <laughs> he's built the, the leading wow. retailer, except for the one American company. Wow. So what I wanted to ask you is this. And I asked this question before this morning. A lot <laughs> of the people here will be saying to themselves, am I like you? <laughs> you haven't told us quite what, what you did at school, when you went to university, which university you chose. That sure. Would help everybody. If you just say just one minute. No, that's a that's a great great question. That's I, I'm fascinated by yeah what you've been up to. Um, no, that's um, no, that's amazing. Like 25 years, I haven't been on the planet that long. So <laughs> um, basically, yeah, I'm uh, my well, so I. Uh, went to a grammar school in in Kent um, called Judd, and uh, I come from Tunbridge. ah yeah, we're in Tunbridge, yeah, great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, basically that's where I met my 
my co-founders and I, I mentioned earlier about how we first started the business and evolved it. And essentially, we had the period through secondary school right through to the end of sixth form was spent juggling Go Squared and work. And I'm pleased to say I managed to successfully do my GCSEs and my A-levels. I, I then decided to take a, a gap here with my co-founder, Jeff, where we would spend that whole time working on the business and trying to see if we could get, to, get it to a point where that could be our full-time jobs, our, our lives. And um, we spent the whole time doing it, and we, we didn't quite get there, but we got to the end of the gap here with about a week to go, and then um, got a call from an investor in London called Eileen. And she said, uh, we like what you've been doing. Can you come and have a meeting with us? And at this point, Jeff, I think, had already gone off to university. He got a place at Nottingham. I had a place lined up for Exeter University uh, to study business management. And I was very much undecided between business management and design. And uh, my school was very academic. And I think that's what pushed me over towards business management. Um, but also Exeter, I really loved loved the, the place as well. Had this meeting with Eileen and Passion Capital at White Bear Yard, which is where we're based, um, and they wanted to put some money in. It wasn't earth-shattering some of the money, but it was a heck of a lot to a 19-year-old a guy, um, or maybe 18, I can't remember now. But basically, we went away from that meeting thinking, what the heck do we do? And I went to, I went to Exeter University for about five weeks, trying to decide what to do. And some people told me I was crazy. Some people told me I was sensible. It was the best thing that could happen. And I just did it. I, I left. Uh, basically, they said I could come back in a year if I needed to. But I, I stepped out, and we started work at, at full time on Go Squared about, uh, yeah, sort of, that, well, literally five weeks after uni started, we were back in, in White Bay Yard working on it full time. And um, since then, that's, that's been my life, really. Like, it's not just a nine to fiver. It, it literally, all, all the time, I'm thinking about and working on making Go Squared better. And it's, I, I love doing it, because there's nothing I'd rather be doing than building our brand and building our name and, and talking to our customers. It's just amazing seeing hundreds, if not thousands, of people using your service that you've slaved over and telling you it actually works. <laughs> um, what when someone told us it worked? Or? <laughs> um, so that was about two years ago. So it was not last September, not the September before, but the one before that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I've been yeah. T it was two and a bit years ago. Yeah. And how long after that did you do the second round of financing? Uh, yeah. So we took like a, the angel round in September of of that year. So. Um, and then 2000 and, yeah, late 2011 was when we raised from Atlas Ventures and Passion Capital, which were involved going over to San Francisco and Silicon Valley and pitching to lots of incredibly scary investors and trying to convince them that we knew what we were doing. And it was amazing to come back and to know that we had actually managed to do it. And it helped us achieve a lot of the things we wanted to do in the last year and grow the company to a point where we're yeah, we're really excited about the future. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. That's yeah. very good. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go for it. Uh, do you think you could do that without investment? I. Sorry, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, yeah, I think doing this again, I would love to try. Um, I think we'd have a business model that could potentially be like, um, you know, bootstrapped entirely. And we had essentially bootstrapped it until that point. The tricky thing for us was, you know, it was going off to uni or running the business full time, <laughs> and um, I knew what I wanted to do, and uh, and it just so happened that the investment kind of was a way of doing that. And uh, I I think looking back, maybe I could have been more prepared for that decision, and and maybe would have made. I, I don't. I can't see how I would have made a different decision now, but. Um, I think going forward, you know, investment is great because it helps you achieve things much faster. And the industry we're in is an incredibly fast-paced industry. Um, but you know, again, it, it just depends on the kind of business you're running. And uh, I'm glad we've done what we've done to date. And uh, yeah, I can't wait for the, the next year or so to see what happens. Yeah.
helpful. Hey, that was useful. Cheers.